Hello fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish. I'm Marissa and today I'm so excited to share the books that I read in the month of Jane Austen, July. July was a fantastic reading month for me and I had so much fun reading books by and about Jane Austen and I can't wait to chat about them all with you. But before I do, I just wanted to say thank you to my wonderful co-hosts, Katie and Claudia. You guys made this month extra special and I was so glad to host Jane Austen July with you. And I also want to thank all of you who participated and contributed to Jane Austen July in your own ways. I saw some wonderful Instagram posts and I'm still working my way through all of the delightful Jane Austen themed content produced in July. So without further ado, let's chat about some Jane Austen related books. The first book I finished in Jane Austen July was The Heiress by Molly Greeley. It's a modern interpretation of the character of Anne de Bourgh from Pride and Prejudice. Like so many Austen retellings or adaptations, the heiress aims to bring an obscured female character's story to light. The heiress explores the premise, what if Anne de Bourgh's illness, which frankly defines her as a character, is actually opioid addiction brought on by her doctor's recommendation of taking laudanum since birth. Though there were aspects of the execution of this book that didn't work for me, it was a fun read and it got me thinking about certain characters and themes from Pride and Prejudice in new ways. I loved the depiction of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, her thoughts on motherhood and her reaction to Anne trying to assert her own independence. The book also explores the intersections of marriage, class, and inheritance, which are of course major themes found in Austen's works. If you want to hear more detailed and nuanced thoughts about this book, I've already done a whole in-depth review on it, and you should check that out on my channel. I'll try and link it up above or down below or both, so you can see that if you're interested. This month, I also read The Real Jane Austen, A Life in Small Things by Paula Byrne. This book is a biography about Jane Austen's life and family. Each chapter begins with a discussion of an object that was owned either by Jane Austen or represents a key moment of her life or an important theme found in her work. In some cases, the object is something from the time period and would have impacted Austen, or is something that Austen would have been familiar with. Among the items discussed are an East Indian shawl, her vellum notebooks with her juvenilia, topaz cross pendants owned by Jane and Cassandra, Jane's writing box, a box of letters, kind of like Scrabble letters, which could be used to play word games, like they do in Emma, or used to teach children how to spell. A card of lace, which has to do with the theft scandal involving Jane's aunt, Jane Lee Perot. All of these objects are used to discuss particular themes in Jane Austen's life and works, and they paint a really well-rounded view of Jane's life and the things that may have influenced her writing. This is quite possibly my favorite Jane Austen biography that I've read so far, mostly because it doesn't just chronicle the life of Jane and her family, but it also examines her work in the context of her life. It provides historical context to Austen's writing that a modern reader may not be aware of. It's a biography, so it's full of information about Austen's relatives and friends and neighbors, her experiences in Bath and in London, the careers of her brothers, the places she visited, etc. But best of all, the author illustrates how these aspects of Austen's life are related to her novels. I particularly liked the portions about Mansfield Park, since I was actively reading Mansfield Park while listening to this on audiobook. I learned that Jane had actually visited the estate of a real abolitionist, Lord Mansfield, and she knew Dido Elizabeth Bell, who was an heiress of color related to Lord Mansfield. There are also very detailed explanations of specifics in Austen's work. One that particularly stood out to me was the explanation of Mary Crawford's comment on rears and vices. In chapter six, Mary Crawford declares, certainly my home at my uncle's brought me acquainted with a circle of admirals, of rears and vices, I saw enough. No, do not be suspecting me of a pun, I entreat. It is a pun on two senior naval ranks, rear admiral and vice admiral. 
but it also alludes to naval sodomy, of which there were public trials before Mansfield Park's publication. And there are plenty of other detailed explanations of Jane Austen's scenes or quotes in this book as well. As much as I loved this biography, I would say that before reading it, you should have knowledge of all of the plots of Austen's novels, including Lady Susan. Otherwise, you'll get major spoilers just from reading it. And it might be helpful to read a more conventional biography of Jane Austen first, even if it's just an article online or something of that nature. This biography, while detailed and well-researched, goes quite out of order, so if you aren't already familiar with Austen's life and the names of her relatives, it could get a bit confusing or be hard to piece together. I also read bits and pieces of Jane Austen's letters this month. I have this really fat edition, and I had no intentions of reading it cover to cover this month, but it was fun to every so often turn to a random page and read a letter or two. It really struck me how Jane Austen's voice in her letters to Cassandra is most reminiscent of her voice in her novels. You get that playful, comic, and satirical side of Austen most prominently in her letters to Cassandra, and those became my favorites to read. In general, her letters are very, very detailed. They have all of this minutia of daily life. Things like so-and-so bought a carriage, someone's having a child in three to four days. And I recall that there was a lengthy description at one point of dish patterns. So it's full of those kinds of details of everyday life. There are tons of place names and people's names that I'm not familiar with as well. I was also struck by how long each letter was and the amount of time and effort that Jane must have spent writing each one. But I guess if I consider all of the time that I spend texting and emailing people, it's really not that astounding. I also perused Jane Austen Embroidery, Regency Patterns Reimagined for Stitchers. I did a whole video all about my embroidery attempts this month, and I gave a sort of an overview on the history of Regency embroidery in that video. This book is full of insights into the significance of fashion and embroidery in Jane's daily life and works. It features patterns from the 1770s to the 1810s derived from Ladies Magazine, which was a popular periodical full of fashion and fiction and gossip. The book is designed to make some of the more obscure Regency patterns accessible again and provide a bit of instruction to the modern reader who perhaps has not held a needle in their hand since the age of six. If you're completely new to embroidery, you might want to supplement this book with some YouTube videos or an introductory book to make sure that you can master all of the basic stitches of embroidery. Embroidery takes a lot longer to do than I previously remembered. Last time I picked it up, I was working part-time and I just had that kind of time on my hands. But it's really a wonderful and relatively cheap hobby to pick up. A little update on my embroidery video. I didn't get as far as I had hoped, but I did basically finish one of the two bookmarks that I was working on. Unfortunately, I have to finish both of the bookmarks before I can cut one out, just based on the way they're placed on the fabric. So it'll probably be a few months before this project is finished. Please let me know in the comments section if you'd like to see updates or if I should just not bother you with my progress. I'm sure if I ever finish them, I will feature the finished product on my Instagram at the very least. So if you want to hear more about the beginnings of this project or the history of Regency embroidery, do check out my other video. And then, of course, what would Jane Austen July be without reading some actual Jane Austen? This month I read Mansfield's Park for the second time and began my second reading of Persuasion. But then I fell woefully behind in the read-along schedule, and so I'll be reading the majority of Persuasion in August. Did anyone else not get around to reading everything they had hoped to this month? So I know that I'll be participating in a very unofficial Austin August, and I hopefully will discuss Persuasion in more depth another time. But my reading of Mansfield Park this year was wonderful. I still don't think it's my favorite Austin, or even in my top three, but I did really enjoy reading it this time around. The real Jane Austen, A Life in Small Things, which I already talked about, gave me interesting insight into the historical context of Mansfield's Park. And I also read Lover's Vows, which I'll discuss in a bit.
but that's the play that's heavily referenced in Mansfield Park, which also really added something quite interesting to my reading experience. Mansfield Park is about the main character of Fanny Price, who is sent off to live with her wealthier relatives at Mansfield Park. She's shy and reserved, and in many ways feels that she's an outsider amongst her cousins with the exception of her closest friend and confidant, Cousin Edmund. When two siblings, Mary Crawford and Henry Crawford, come to town bringing London glamour and flirtation, Fanny's female cousins vie for Henry's attention, and Edmund becomes smitten with Mary. Only Fanny is doubtful about the Crawfords' influence on the inhabitants of Mansfield Park and she feels alone as ever. Mansfield Park is full of Austin's usual themes of marriage, class, and inheritance, but behind these domestic English themes lies England's role in the slave trade. I absolutely love reading about the characters in Mansfield Park, particularly Lady Bertram and Mrs. Norris and the Crawfords. Last time I read Mansfield Park, I neglected to notice how hilarious Lady Bertram truly is. She is such a lazy, useless creature. She's blissfully unaware of everyone at Mansfield Park, and she's just living her best life on a cushy sofa, letting the world pass by around her. It's quite hysterical. One of my favorite scenes with Lady Bertram is when she says that she'll do more for Fanny than she ever did for Mariah, and she actually promises Fanny one of her precious pugs puppies. The scene comes across as quite comical, but coming from Lady Bertram, it's really an astounding gesture of love, and it shows that she cares about Fanny deeply, perhaps more deeply than her own daughter. And then there's Mrs. Norris, who is an absolute monster and hysterical in her own way. She's awful and manipulative. She constantly makes Fanny feel inferior to her cousins, but she wants to seem benevolent and thoughtful. She's perfectly happy to arrange for the inconvenience and the expense of the Bertrams taking Fanny in, and she manages to take all of the credit and goodwill for the idea while planning to shoulder none of the responsibility for actually raising or caring for Fanny. The way she is able to continuously manipulate others in the guise of goodwill is impressive and hideous and so interesting to read about. And then, of course, there are the Crawfords. I love attempting to determine how authentic and genuine their actions and motives are throughout the course of the book. Is Mary a good friend to Fanny? Is Henry's proposal in earnest? It's all so debatable, and they're all such wonderfully drawn, morally ambiguous characters. And then, of course, there's the characterization of Fanny herself. Some find her plain, boring, and moralistic. but. I just find her painfully shy, reserved, and incredibly introspective. Gauging the accuracy of Fanny's perceptions of other characters and of the story unfolding around her is part of the fun of this book. To what extent is Fanny the voice of reason? And to what extent are her perceptions of the Crawfords in particular clouded by her feelings for Edmund? There's so much to think about and unpack with Mansfield Park, and hopefully I'll find time to film a Mansfield Park video or two before too long. Next, I want to chat all about my reading of Lover's Vows by Elizabeth Inchbald, which is very linked with my reading of Mansfield Park. Lover's Vows is based on a German play and was first performed at Covent Garden in 1798. It's a play that Jane Austen was obviously familiar with, as it's the very play that is featured in Mansfield Park when the Bertrams and the Crawfords and Mr. Rushworth and Tom's friend, Mr. Yates, attempt to put on amateur theatrics while Sir Tom Bertram is in Antigua. A lot of modern day readers struggle to understand why the amateur theatrical production in Mansfield Park would be so scandalous to the 19th century reader. And part of that has to do with the subject matter of the play itself. The original German title of the play is translated as Love Child, or Natural Son, and Elizabeth Inchbald's version still deals with themes of sex outside marriage and illegitimate birth. When you consider young people acting out these scenes of sexual promiscuity, all the while flirting mercilessly with each other and having little to no supervision, you start to understand how there might be some objections to this seemingly innocent notion of let's put on a play. Personally, I really enjoyed reading the entirety of the play and thinking about the casting of the characters. It definitely shed a new light for me on Mansfield Park. 
plus the play was a lot of fun to read. I was surprised by how engaging and understandable the dialogue was, especially since I don't usually enjoy the writing of Jane Austen's contemporaries. As I was reading the play, I tried to imagine the Mansfield Park characters acting it out, which was a lot of fun. It was not lost on me that Mariah Bertram opens the play as a fallen woman, a destitute, a sick beggar. If you're familiar with the play, perhaps that casting is meant to be Jane Austen's foreshadowing of Mansfield Park. The casting of Mr. Rushworth as the Count, a foolish character, is rather ironic and slightly hysterical, of course. The casting that interested me the most, though, is that of Henry Crawford as Frederick. Frederick is a son who is reunited with his mother after five years away at war. He comes back to find his mother a beggar, and desperate to help her, he robs two men in the woods. Unbeknownst to him, he's actually the illegitimate son of one of the men that he tried to rob, and the plot goes on from there. What exactly does this casting say about Henry Crawford's character? He's a dutiful son who means well, but is willing to do bad things, such as stealing to support his mother. Like Mr. Crawford, Frederick has a mixed sense of morality, to be sure. That being said, he isn't a love interest in the play, and therefore is not cast in a naturally flirtatious role. It's Anne Halt, played by Edmund, and Amelia, played by Mary Crawford, who have the romantic scenes where they profess their undying love for one another on stage. Though an argument could be made that Henry Crawford's character, Frederick, has plenty of lines with Mariah Bertram, who plays his mother. That gives them the opportunity to interact with each other and even embrace one another, albeit as mother and son. So does this casting redeem or condemn Henry Crawford's character? It's hard to say, but even though he's morally ambiguous, ultimately the character of Frederick is actually rewarded at the end of this play. I recommend reading Lover's Vows in conjunction with Mansfield Park to see how it impacts your reading of Austen's work. As if this video wasn't long enough already, I also enjoyed some Jane Austen film adaptations, namely the 1999 version of Mansfield Park, the 1995 version of Persuasion, the 2007 version of Persuasion, and the 2020 Hulu film of Modern Persuasion. I hope I got all of those years correct. I found the 1999 version of Mansfield Park fascinating and infuriating all at the same time. It's as if they gave Fanny Price a personality transplant. I guess a reserved and introspective heroine just doesn't make the cut in Hollywood, so they transformed Fanny into a combination of the spirited Lizzie Bennet and the witty authoress herself. I didn't mind that they brought the issue of slavery more to the forefront, but I thought it was quite out of character for Fanny to be so openly opinionated on the subject. And I thought that Mrs. Norris wasn't nearly as nasty as she is in the book. I was also disappointed with the casting of Edmund. I love Johnny Lee Miller, but my brain has trouble registering him as any Austen character other than Mr. Knightley. I don't really like Edmund as a character in Mansfield Park, and Johnny Lee Miller's charm makes him a much more likable Edmund, and not the Edmund that I envision in the text. Besides the characters of Fanny and Edmund, and maybe a nicer Mrs. Norris, I really enjoyed the film's portrayal of the story. Modern Persuasion was, as the trailer might suggest, not the best film ever, but it was a fun rom-com nonetheless. I'd recommend it if you're a Jane Austen fan in the mood for a cheesy rom-com. In terms of Persuasion. The 1995 version is the winner, I think, but honestly I watched the 1995 version and the 2007 version in such close succession that I now can't separate the two in my head. It's a problem and it makes it difficult for me to talk more about my opinions on them. I do recall finding the shaky camera and the scenes where Anne runs around Bath in the 2007 version to be overly dramatic, though. On the plus side, while trying to track down the 2007 version of Persuasion, I discovered BritBox, and now I can watch tons of British TV shows and period dramas and book adaptations, so I'm really excited about that. So that is my Jane Austen July reading and watching wrap-up. I had such a wonderful Jane Austen July this year, and I think I actually managed to get 
to all of the challenges, which is really exciting, and I'm not sure if I've ever done that before. I had more fun with Jane Austen July on Instagram than I ever have before, and I would love to hear all about your Jane Austen Julys in the comments down below. What did you read? Did you get to read everything you wanted? Or will you also be participating in an impromptu Austin August? What were the highlights of your Jane Austen July? Feel free to chat about any of the topics I talked about in the comments section down below. And until next time, I look forward to seeing you all in another video very soon. Bye!